Vim, The Tale of Immortality by Dysylvania Episode 4, Displaced Guess who's back? Me, your favorite magical book of recollections. And I got my beautiful voice back. Yeah, uh, don't get me started on that, but let's get this recap going because plenty of things have happened since we last heard from one another. And that is quite the understatement. So here we go! The last time we saw Genevieve, Kate, Shaklashak and Gregory, they were staring in awe and disgust at the statue of Lucius. We leave them there for a while, as the Hand of Faith guides us back a few hours and into the Jovis district, lovingly known as the Purple, a district brimming with buildings adorned with purple motives, wondrous gardens, and the hubbub of socialites who, on this day, the sixth day of the week, engaged in celebrating solace. It was a quaint day. Gold leaves danced through the air like fireflies. People in colorful clothes made their way towards the Purple University, the epicenter of the festival. It's Solace Day after all, and on this day, everyone celebrates knowledge. We moved beneath archways made of roses, past boutiques and magic shops, and finally, we arrived at Persephone's, a lavish building that served many roles for those who passed through its doors, and, by the exalted looks of those who came out, it seems that their motto enter with an open mind and leave with a smile, was not false advertising. Within its walls, we observed many sublime paintings which depicted the beauty of the naked body in its most intimate moments. About two dozen people dressed in scanty yet luxurious clothes engaged in titillating conversations. Blending in among the patrons, a figure caught our attention, a half-elven individual dressed of course, in purple robes, with a face that could make even the most stoic paladin blush, even more so if he considered his somewhat disheveled look. I would wage my life savings that this look was done by an expert and cost a fortune, but good thing I'm only a book and don't have any savings, or a life. Uh, anyway, let's move on. The disheveled, overly handsome guy's name is Pax, and he was using his honey-coated tongue to charm the people accompanying him. But his attention was caught by a ringing doorbell, set in motion by the presence of another half-elf. A woman with white shoulder-length hair, milky ethereal eyes, and bleached discolorations on her face in the shape of a butterfly, similar to those on her chest and arms. She approached Pax. Her mother's clothes and purple vest were a sign that she was not a patron of this establishment, and she wouldn't have been there if she hadn't had news. We were made privy of two aspects. Her name was Grace Griffin, and, following their first encounter a day before, she needed Pax's help smuggling some nocturnals into Greenspring at the behest of Monkey, a businessman who dealt with misplaced magical items. Okay, let's break down the lingo. Businessman means, well, hustler, and misplaced is most definitely stolen. To aid in smuggling these people, Pax was offered an enchanted mark of acceptance, a permit mandatory for any race, aside from humans, who wanted to enter Greenspring and pass through its districts. These items would allow him, via magic, to perform any type of forgery. A lucrative deal for Monkey, worth every coin. Grace and Pax exited Persephone's, making their way towards the gate where Genevieve, Kate, Shaq and Gregory were waiting. And, as they were contemplating their options, they saw a half-orc pleading with one of the guards, mark of acceptance in hand, to be let through. After taking a closer look at his papers, the guard allowed the half-orc to set foot into Greenspring, just as an elven individual tried to sneak by. But the guard noticed him and ordered the elf to show his mark. The elf started running away, drawing the other guards after him like a magnet. The group began plotting on how to get their hands on some documents and get into the city, just as Pax and Grace approached them. 
introductions were made and, after some back and forths, our four adventurers, who were so ruthlessly plucked out of their timeline, offered Pax much to ponder. The half-elf wasn't sure those were the people Monkey was looking for. However, he set his doubts aside and agreed to forge the necessary documents with magic and skill, despite the day's restrictions against enchantments. Although Pax's face remained as beautiful and unmarked by the ever-growing revelations, there was a knowing glint in his eyes. He invited them to a nearby tavern, as forgery was not an appropriate topic for the main city entrance, in the earshot of the Greenspring Guards. In the relative safety and protection of the tavern, Pax began forging the necessary documents for our travelers, while they filled their bellies with warm food and drowned their sorrows in some alcohol, relentlessly questioning Pax some more. Although, for them, the events within the Kronos Sanctum happened three days ago, 437 years had actually passed. Lucius became king of Greenspring, Hebdom was the leader of the Order of the Hebdomad, the new faith. Magic was brought to life, and humans built a strong green empire. Genevieve's village was swallowed by the ever-expanding city, and the culprits of all this were now long gone, their bodies transported by boats along the Sabbath River. If only the revelation stopped there, but the gang found out that the Church of Enduring, built in the early years of Valbois, was still standing, and people were still able to follow the rites of their belief. Many of the Nocturnals relocated to a place known as Nocturna Obscura, and, above all else, Every person they knew and loved was now probably dead. The final piece of the revelation was the hardest pill to swallow. Not only did the events of what happened beneath the Chrono Sanctum became, as Pax said, history, but Lucius was known to have sired many bastards, one of which could have been with Gregory's sister, Alea. In fact, Many princesses and princes that were in line for the ruling of Greenspring had the same red hair as hers. Oh my, drama! With the papers in check and some money provided by Pax, the next obstacle for the group was finding a place to stay. The two guides offered them some options. Either take shelter at Monkey's compound, or join Pax and get accommodated inside Persephone's. In the end, the latter was picked. As the group walked through the streets of the purple, they even encountered Jovis. As the astral was standing to their garden and signing autographs, Pax told Jovis that his newfound company was connected to the constellations shown to him in his most recent dreams, and, at a closer inspection, Jovis remembered them. Either because of the way the astral carried themselves, or to a lack of answer, the group departed feeling more betrayed and definitely more enraged than they were before. Continuing through the streets of the Jovis district, they met protesters raging about the hardships of non-human races and the unfair laws regarding the mark of acceptance. Inside Persephone's, however, the air exuded relaxation and excitement as the patrons, each more scantily dressed than the other, engaged in seductive conversations. Upon seeing this tableau of hedonism, Kate remarked that they were definitely overdressed, as Pax approached the matron of this establishment, Persephone, a ravishing woman with curly long hair and features that, although human, were slightly undefined and retained a bit of fuzziness. When Pax introduced the group to her, she was more than delighted to meet them, undressing them with her eyes fixing her gaze on Gregory. The matron was thrilled to include this new group in their ongoing festivities, but the excitement was cut short by Pax's remark that they weren't accustomed to Greenspring, and that, maybe, for the time being, they shouldn't be included. They were weary travelers and needed a bit of freshening up. Persephone, looking slightly disappointed, offered them the key that opened the room of the embrace. After taking a shower that left them feeling dirtier than they were before, 
Pax led them to the taste of Jovis, where their discussion quickly turned back to the monkey business. Did I do that on purpose? <laughs> oh, I am a fun book, aren't I? Pax and Grace told the group that Monkey was interested in smuggled magical items, which he accepted in exchange for the marks, money, and moonstones. Moonstones, darling, are shiny objects that allow you to wander through Greenspring at night. With a new goal in mind, they proceeded to Nomad Nook, Monkey's place of operations, a shabby four-story tavern, a testament to Monkey's business skills, squeezed between two other Jovisian-looking homes. Inside, the music was all-encompassing, but there were no clients to be found. Knowing Monkey, Grace told the group that they wouldn't find him there, suggesting trying the basement instead. Before making their way to Monkey's office, the group indulged in the best drinks they've ever had. Except for Kate, whose drink got spilled on the bar right in front of her. Even Genevieve was taken aback by the sublime taste of beverages, but her appreciation was cut short by the drinks and plates with food magically flying around and spilling everything everywhere. That's magical delivery for you. I don't recommend it. What also caught their eye were the paintings whose magical enchantments made it possible for people to be instantly drawn in different poses and, of course, the intertwining and seemingly endless corridors that made themselves visible from time to time. Within the underbelly of the tavern, all was quiet, not even the slightest echo of music could be heard, as Monkey's office door was opened by a six-foot-tall handsome fellow. That's Arches, and it seems that Pax might have engaged in some flirtation talk with him, but could you blame him? In the office, we saw mahogany desks, upon which sat all sorts of boxes, papers, crates, and chaotically placed items. Within the room, the group met two people. One of them, a black-haired guy, was sitting face down at his desk, no doubt trying to put the over in hangover. The other, tall and lanky, stood near the corner of the room, reading a book. Aside from his long, light blonde hair, his face and hands were covered by tattoos or marks that followed a vine-like pattern. As he set his gaze on the group, he sneezed, resulting in his hair and marks turning ablaze for a few moments. He introduced himself as Blaze, a fitting name, don't you think? With Monkey awake and the introductions made, business ensued. Although Monkey didn't exude the greatest wit, he quickly picked up that the people standing in front of him were not, in fact, the people he was waiting for. I mean, the letter given to Monkey spoke about three elves, after all. After a few tense moments of social combat with plenty of bargaining, both parties came to an agreement. Items were given for moonstones, money for marks, and... At the end of it all, the group owed Monkey a simple favor in exchange for his generous offer. All they had to do was enter the Cloud District, find a man named Bob, and bring back an item not yet revealed to them. They left Monkey and reached the Cloud District, which was the fulcrum point of the economy in Greenspring, but their progress was halted by the apparition of someone from Pax's past. Albus, the ex-boyfriend, was enraged at the mere sight of his former lover, unable to control his emotions. Which, let me tell you, dear audience, isn't such a nice trait to have. Too much of a red flag for someone hailing from Greenspring. So, where was I? Oh yeah. Albus began casting all sorts of spells that resulted in many pots and crates exploding, and, somehow, the misfired magic caused four sublime roosters to grow in size. And... Oh, come on! Where's the rest of the story? Don't leave me hanging! We have giant roosters! What will our fun bunch do next? Cook them? Ride them into the sunset? I hate cliffhangers! Ah, Alas, the story goes on when it goes on. This was the recap for episode 4 of Vim as told by the Book of Recollections. I'm Ruxandra Vorotnek, your recap narrator. If you'd like to follow our Dungeons & Dragons campaign, Vim, The Tale of Immortality, 
Tune in Sundays at 5 UTC on youtube.com slash New recaps drop every Friday evening. Thanks for sticking with us and remember, every subscribe keeps the magic going. Good day, good night, and don't let the vampire bite! <laughs>